Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian Simpson. I lead our professional services group at Pathematics. And I'm here today to talk to you about the rise of direct-to-consumer disruptors. But before I do, I kind of had a thought as I was coming in here that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, you know, we're at a two-day conference we're about three quarters of the way through. This is the last lunch before the end, so the bulk of this conference is now behind us, and you all have been working really hard the last few days, right? Like you've been networking, sitting in a lot of great lectures, learning a lot, your brains are spinning around, you're meeting new people, you're even drinking a lot. So we're at that kind of place where, you know, there's some potential fatigue that can set in. And so I have this kind of position here where I'm like the border between the whole first part of the conference and the last part of the conference. And so it kind of dawned on me that like, uh, not in an egotistical way, but just in a factual way, like what I do might set the stage for how you know the rest of your conference goes. Like if I come out and I take my clicker and I flip through my slides one by one, and I tell you all the great things that I have prepared to tell you, and I answer some questions at the end, well, great. I've done exactly what you expect that I'm going to do, right? Like, everything is normal. Just check that box on the next presentation and go to the next one, and it just kind of fits in really, really nicely. What if, what if I was really nervous? What if I, like, was afraid that I might not get all my words out or that I might forget something, and so I made a speech. I write it all down, and I come out here, I stand at this podium and I word for word I just read every word verbatim to make sure I don't miss anything. Sometimes I make eye contact, sometimes I stumble and go back and reread it because I missed up a word. It's gonna kind of like, you gotta out of here, right? Like you're just gonna go get dessert and talk to someone else. Like this was a nothing burger kind of communication and off to the what if I like took it really too far? What if I come running out and I strap fast, make some noise! <laughs> Can't hear you! Come on, strap fast! I want to hear more! <laughs> oh, God. That's weird. We're not in a concert. We're here. Like, yeah, I can do that, but why would I do that? That would be bizarre. You guys would be like, oh I gotta get out of here. This is too intense. I can't be a part of this. I could use some other tools in the toolbox. There's these conversational ways of speaking. I could come into the crowd. I could come and say, hi, how's it going? What's your name? Penny. Where do you work? I copy marketing. Really? What's your favorite brand? Mm. Glossier. Great, we can have a conversation about Glossier. I come over here and say, what's your favorite brand? Oh, Dove. Dove, right. So, <laughs> We could have this whole conversation together about Gossier and Dove and everyone's favorite brands and very engaging kind of situation down here, right? So that's, that's another thing that I could do if I wanted to. Or in a trick that I just learned actually last week, I could raise my voice to an ever, ever higher crescendo and then I can stop. And after three seconds, speak in a normal, commanding voice and I have all of your attention right here. Isn't that cool? It just was, actually. <laughs> I didn't know if that would work. Um, <laughs> um, the point is, I have all these tools in my toolbox for how I want to come talk to you guys. And I haven't even used the most, you know, the most extreme ones. Like, maybe I'm just a guy who likes to curse. Ah, oh, shit. Oh, these guys are stupid. Right now, I'm very edgy. I'm extreme. I'm also human, because everybody curses. I might even try to blow your mind. I might do something completely different that you haven't seen yet so far. Maybe I just pop down on the ground and do a headstand and do my entire D to C disruptors talk on my head. I'll do that. Should I do that? Do it! <laughs> now the good news is if I fail, 
<laughs> Audiences are known to like like the underdog. But I don't intend to fail. And I'm just gonna stay here and talk to you all around. We'll talk about Hulu and we'll talk about Netflix. And I'll just do this for the next hour. <laughs> Not, I won't really. But it works, right? Who remembers that Old Spice commercial from like 10 years ago now? With a guy with that shirt, he's really rough. He's on a horse, he's backwards, he's on the beach. He's talking about Old Spice. It was so random. Like everyone loved it. It was Old Spice. Like they had the word old in their name and they completely reinvented themselves because they came up with that one campaign. And it just captured the attention of so many people. So I have all these tools in my toolbox today to come talk to you when I choose to come and, and give a talk. The fine line that I have to walk is do I use those tools effectively and look authentic? Or do I use them ineffectively and just look like a fraud? Some of you here, maybe one of you knows that that whole crescendo thing was on a TED talk last week. And that's where I got it, and I totally stole it, word for word. Everything that, that I just said was on that TED talk. So one of you here knows that I'm, I'm a fraud, that I, that I stole that completely. But if you liked it, then that was authentic. And that's good news for all of us. We heard from Jesse Darris yesterday that D to C disruptors, like the tie that binds them all together, is authenticity. They start with a story, the story becomes their mission, the mission becomes their story again, and they know how to, I think as he put it, build the flywheels in hot inside to keep that story going, and then they have the right teams in place to spread that story far and wide in a way that feels authentic and captures the hearts and minds of consumers. And so what I'm here to do today is talk to you about some of those disruptors and how they've done that. But because I come from a data company, I'm going to use data to do it. We'll talk about what they did, but we're also going to talk about the things that we were able to see within Pathmatics that actually um, can describe what they actually did. Because, and I am going to plug us here now because this is the right time to do it. Pathmatics is a data company and it's amazing. We capture every ad on the internet and we present it to our clients and all the data that goes on with it such that marketers have the information that they need to not just be marketers but to become marketing wizards. Like, I don't even think Pathmatics has code. Like, if I knew how to look at the code, which I don't, but if I sat down at the computer and I like, show me the code, I wouldn't see the ones and zeros. I think I would just see like a bright white light shining at me like inside of the briefcase in the Pulp Fiction, right? It's just, it's magic what we do. And so I want to bring that to you today and show you how we can use some of that magic in making decisions for our brands and for our companies and for our clients that have a real impact. Uh, my name is Ian, as I said, I work for Pathmatics. We're a marketing intelligence platform designed to help marketers, blah, blah, blah. What we really are, we're a magical place where marketers go to become wizards. Right? That's what we do. We create this online resource for you as a marketer to know everything your competitors are doing online. And that's something really powerful. Here's what we do. First, we go out with all these different methodologies and technologies and we scour the entire internet. Facebook, digital, um, display, video, mobile. We bring all the data back in every ad that we see. Our system then records all that data. We enrich it. We put a whole bunch of metadata behind it so that we can get even stronger and better insights. Then we have these robots that are powered by magic. And they just calculate everything that they need to calculate. They figure out the spend, the impressions. They use all of our algorithms to put it together so that ultimately we can create this dashboard and report it out in this really wonderful experience for our clients. That dashboard does not look like this, but it's a really nice representation. I'm going to tease you here and not tell you what it actually looks like because we have a great table outside. If you want to know what it looks like, you should go talk to our folks and get it down. Um, if I do it here, then I'm just doing a product. You don't want that. 
But it's called Pathmatics Explorer, and it's really amazing. You should check it out after this talk or the break. But what we're here to do today, as I said, is to talk about the rise of these disruptors. So let's start with what we analyze. Like if you just go to Google and you say, oh, what's a direct-to-consumer brand? You're going to get all these different definitions, lots of blog posts, people have written about it. I think you've heard everything you need to hear about what they are from Jesse yesterday. And our friends at Luma decided to like map out the whole world and we get this, ah, so many disruptors. You can't believe there's anything left to disrupt. All these people. <laughs> Disrupting everything all the time. Um, at Pathmatics, we have the information to be able to organize all this and to sort of like look what they're doing, both in mass and also down to the individual level. So let's put these guys away. I was just bringing out like, here's some of the top brands that we've captured from Pathmatics, but that you all know. And the tie that brings them all together, yeah. they're category disruptors, they're mobile native. Marketing is the engine of their growth. We've heard all that before. But what's become interesting is we put this whole presentation together is that some of them are pretty late stage. Like they may be disruptors, but they are now the incumbent, right? Like these guys have um, brands that are established with their own competitors, like they're ready to be disrupted potentially already. And that kind of bears out in some of the data that I'm going to show you today. So keep that in mind. Remember the watchword here is authenticity. So as we go through all of this, the question I'm going to ask is, have we seen an authentic representation of these brands? We looked at all these brands, we looked at over 200, we looked at 290. I want to say over, but no, it was exactly 290 brands across all these channels, social, which means Facebook. Um, for us, although, another little aside, we're launching Twitter in two weeks. Um, desktop display, and mobile display, desktop video and mobile video. We capture all these metrics, and we're looking at the data for this year, 2019. Uh, everything that's come now across 20 categories and actually 230 different creatives that we were able to look at. So let's start on the big kind of macro trend like what do we need to know? I think the biggest, most important thing is like, hey, Facebook is really real. It's a thing that is not going away, even if they're in you know talks in Congress for anti um, monopoly charges and all that kind of stuff. 78% of all spend, real spend, is happening on Facebook with display and video taking up just uh, the remaining 22%. Uh, we saw Facebook grow 43% from this time last year uh, to this year. And if you take the top 20, you know the 80-20 rule, the top 20% of all the brands in that 290, they're spending on average 1.2 million every single month on Facebook, so uh, that's a ton of money. And to kind of draw that out a little bit more specifically, this is year to date for last year, this is year to date for this year. This is flat, that's display. This is flat, that's video. Actually it is like, there's like an 11% growth here, you just kind of can't see that. But look at Facebook. The spend went up 43%, and we're not even done with the year yet, this is just, Till October, last year and October this year. So whatever consumers might think of Facebook, brands are definitely still in Facebook and they're definitely still uh, investing in Facebook. Just a little bit of, uh, what's the word? Just, just to make sure we're all on the same page. These are the different posts that we see when we look at Facebook. The link post, the video post, carousel post, a status post, just like anyone else's status and a, and a basic photo. I only put that here because Pathmatics tracks all this information we know down to the type of post and it matters. Different companies choose different mechanisms to reach their consumers. And so if you look at all those 230,000 creatives that we uh, reviewed, 62% of them use link posts, which makes sense. It's common, it's easy, people understand it. Another 24 use video, which also makes sense. We're all here creating stories. We want to be able to tell those stories in a way that's engaging. We want our users to share it and drive up views. Video is a great way to do that. So we've got these kind of niche ones, carousel posts, photo posts, status posts. But the right brand uses the right mix of these in order to tell their story. We looked at all the industries involved in all these 
different D to C companies across that Lumoscape. 21% of all the spend is in style, fashion, and beauty. Why do you think that is? It's an easy, it's a gimme for someone who wants to raise their hand and answer. It's very D to C. And fashion and style and beauty creates really shareable experiences, right? Like you wear something, you want to tell people about it. Retail is part and parcel of that. Right? You create a product, you create a brand, you put together something that presents that brand out to folks, and it becomes a shareable experience that you can push all the way across the whole social graph. Um, art and entertainment follows, that's Hulu, Netflix, those guys are just dropping a ton of money into Facebook, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And then the others kind of follow in. The point here is if you're thinking about Facebook, you probably are already thinking about Facebook, obviously, but as you consider how do you take it into the next level, just know all these other brands are really investing heavily there. It's a very crowded space. You're still competing for eyeballs in a space where it used to be like kind of cool, and now it's just a de facto. So again, we're not talking about disruptions anymore, we're talking about like standard and everybody's there so everybody's spending there um, and so you're gonna have to do a lot to try to break through that clutter <clears throat> now we talked about the 80 20 rule let's even get to like the top 10 or 20 actual not percentage wise these are the guys who spent the most in the 10 months from or the nine months I should say from January to the end of September of this year uber came out number one Netflix and Hulu tied basically number two Peloton and Stitch Fix and starting to get out of like uh, advertise, uh, entertainment, we come down into like these really good direct to consumer brands. If you look at just the top eight, they're spending $5.7 million every month on Facebook. These are huge budgets. These are lots and lots and lots of money. They're pushing out these ads. We're not talking about organic, right? You all have social listening tools. If you don't, you should get one. They're really good. They do all that organic stuff, but this is paid. This is where they're putting their actual like strategies behind their budgets are going into this. And, and you can see like the guys who are the most established who have the biggest budgets, they're the ones using it the most. And as you'll see in a little bit, teaser, they're not really telling you any stories anymore. So for the remainder of this time, I just want to go through the top 10 and walk through sort of mini case studies to show you what people are doing and the question is going to be are these authentic are these doing what they should be doing on facebook and we might have our judgment of that but remember every company has a strategy and they're implementing their strategy they even if you think they're not authentic maybe it's driving sales and so that would be fine right we want sales. so let's start here with number 10 spotify obviously a big disruptor when Music sharing was in its nascent um, form. Spotify spent $7 million on Facebook last year and $18 million on digital altogether. They're targeting mostly men. They're targeting folks with Apple phones, but they're targeting across the entire United States. Mathematics can see that. Mathematics knows you know, who are they targeting when they go out on Facebook. Male, female splits, geo splits, and uh, and, and, uh, and phone operating system splits. Um, when you look at the data, just across what type of posts, you see that they got about three quarters, 71% in linked posts. But then there's this other kind of big chunk, 27% in video posts. So they've got a dual strategy, and I think it's instructive to figure out what are they doing. They're a subscription service. So when it comes to their link posts, they got one mission. That is their call to action, sign up. Ad after ad after ad, thousands of ads, and they all say essentially the same thing. Give us a try, get a deal. Three months for 99 cents, 30 days for free. Um, in some cases, it's three months for 9.99. It's causing a problem for them. Um, but they're always saying, just come on over and give us a shot. You know if you try us, some of you are gonna stick around, and that's the subscription model. Right? But what else is happening with this video post? There's, now they're using learn more as their call to action. And all of a sudden they're doing something very different. They're talking about feelings. They're talking about situations that can be 
um, real life situations that can be uh, felt by you and how you might use Spotify to express yourself when those situations come up. And they've also partnered with Hulu, and so they really want to promote their partnership with Hulu. And so they've done that in each of these examples on the video side and on the music side. So you've got this, let's see, oh, look that one. You've got this uh, ad here. They spent $184,000 on this video post. It garnered 2.3 million views. Not a whole bunch of likes, not a whole bunch of comments, but it did get seen a lot. And the, toast, the, co the, the, the post just says, maybe she lost her phone. So you're like, oh, I don't know, what does that mean? Maybe she lost her phone. And um, so let's see what they're doing here. It's kind of, um, it's gonna go by quick, so I'm gonna replay it. But this is that ad if you click on it. All right, did you catch it? That was really fast. Feel more of what you're feeling now, Spotify, with Hulu. If we go back and look at it with a little bit more clarity, she hasn't replied in three hours. Oh, I feel bad. Life sucks. I just sent her a text and she didn't reply. This is my Life Sucks playlist. But it's not enough just to have it on a playlist. I'm gonna to go to the TV. I'm gonna watch a show called You're the Worst. I've never seen this show. Maybe it's got nothing to do with being the worst. But um, you know, if I'm feeling in a bad mood, now I've got two ways that I can express myself. But, whoa. You guys navigating this like this. There we go. She replied in three seconds. Whoa, I'm in the money. That's my new playlist. But I want to go to spot. I want to go to Hulu and watch something on Hulu that makes me feel like I'm. Uh, I'm going to get some action. And now I've got this show, which also I haven't seen. I'm just getting the innuendo. And I'll leave it at that. They push this ad over and over and over again, ultimately saying, if you get Spotify, you get Hulu, and you can express yourself across any medium you want, whatever life situation is. And because they're equal opportunity folks, they have a version of this um, for women. You follow him and he follows back. You follow him and he doesn't. Right? So, authentic, inauthentic, what do you guys think? Maybe. It turns out that when you click, it's the same landing page. Follow, you know, learn more is not learn more, it's just click and sign up. Like, they still have a goal, sign up as many people as you want. So if you start to dissect it, you can ask the question, authentic or not. But it is a good attempt, I think, at telling a story and trying to capture someone's emotional situation, you know, try to capture their tie to a real life feeling. Now, you know, Hulu, or I should say Spotify, they're spreading their money around. They got 39% in Facebook, but they've also got other channels that they're investing in too. And so when you're putting a plan together, if you're trying to compete with Spotify, and you're putting a plan together, you need to know where they are, you need to know what they're doing, you need to be able to either address what they're saying, counter what they're saying, challenge what they're saying. Whatever you want to do, you need the information in order to figure it out. Let's look at uh, Just Fabulous. They're a parent company for these brands, Just Fab, Fat Kids, Shoe Dazzle, and Fabletics. They're the number nine spender. They're a direct-to-consumer uh, company with um, leggings, with shoes, and boots. Um, I call this the represent me all the way. Yesterday we heard from uh, Amy from Dove, and she talked about represent me. It's something like a movement. Um, they spent $22.9 million just in this year alone. 16 and a half of that went to Facebook. And check out the ads. Oh, let's start here. No surprise, they're marketing to women. They've got women's clothes and women's shoes. Um, but they also sell these fab kids. So I guess maybe that's what's in that sliver. Uh, and they're putting these ads in major metropolitan areas and kind of, you know, um, in a very even way. We actually see a lot of ads, even though the big dots are here, we see a lot of ads all across the country. Direct to consumer, your consumer is anywhere. Here's one of the ads that jumped out at me. $39,000 went into this ad. 1,000 likes, <coughs> 500 comments, 29 shares. We learned about Represent Me all the way last, or yesterday. Here's the second ad. 
6,300 likes, 422 comments, 291 shares. We're putting, frankly, it's not a whole lot of money, right? Like if you're talking about some of the other brands putting hundreds of thousands behind an ad, $64,000 to get 6,300 likes and 500 comments and 300 shares. So the proof is like, is it authentic? Or are people hating on it? Well, like here's one of the comments that we saw come in. Nice to finally see a model that represents about 90% of us. And so this is ad after ad after ad. The people that they're using, the models that they're using in these ads, they represent everybody because they know everybody can wear their product and they should wear their product. Authentic? Authentic? Yes. <laughs> sure, right? It feels authentic. The comments are the answer. If you want to know if a brand is authentic, look at what they're doing and then check out the comment section. If the folks that are commenting are like, oh, this is bullshit, then Claire, it's not so authentic. But if people are really loving it, okay, we can say that they're making a hit with their, with their and again, the paid ad. We know that they have a Facebook page where they're talking organically to consumers. This is how they're trying to reach out to people through their dollars. Number eight on the list is Casper. Casper is that mattress that everybody loves. I just stayed in New York uh, over the summer for a while in an Airbnb, and part of the Airbnb ad or the Airbnb like profile for this page was, we have a Casper mattress. Come stay at our apartment, we have a Casper. So Casper has obviously been able to make some inroads here. I'm just going to move the mouse. Okay. Um, what's Casper doing? Casper, I think, I think we might agree, is now a later stage disruptor, right? Like they've been around a while at this point, um, and they've got to they've got to try to continuously connect as they get more and more mature. They have to be a fresh company to everyone who's going out and buying a mattress. How often do you buy a mattress? Like, you know, like every 15 years. So. If Casper's not you know, on your list now and you're ready in six to seven years to buy a mattress, they still have to be authentic. They still have to be fresh. They still have to be something. So that's going to be their challenge for a long time to come. And look at the number one ad that they posted on Facebook this year. $565,000 that they put against it. Video posts, 22,000 likes, all kinds of great engagement metrics. Here's what they did. But their number two and number three creative didn't even come close. 450,000 on a link ad, 390,000 on another link ad. Metrics were far, far lower, right? 86 comments, 
versus 2,800 comments, but they kept this anchor for their campaign through the whole course of the year. This, this, this came out, I believe, in January of this year. Um, and so, you know, this one video kind of anchored it, and they've been writing this way for a really long time, getting a ton of positivity from their consumers. That's the name of the game though, right? If, you're, if you start looking inauthentic and start getting a lack of that positivity, you're gonna have problems. These guys were able to figure this out. Oh, that happened again. Okay, this brand Zenny, number seven in spend. I don't even know them, but there's people who do. They sell glasses, uh, $30 million in spend overall with half of that going into Facebook. When we look at them, when we look at where they're putting their money, Look at that. These guys are among the few who are really investing in these carousel posts. 48% of their total spend in carousel posts. If you've never seen one, they're carousels. You click on the arrow and it goes and it slides. They have products for everybody. They want to be sure that everybody who sees their ad can capture, can see themselves in their product. So, you know, they launched this new... Um, this new brand, this new uh, product called Blocks. They invented a reason for you to have it called Fry Eye. I guess that's, uh, the sun is so bright. Who needs Blocks? She needs it when she's sitting in her house having coffee. She needs it when she's out walking. She needs it, or he, when they're at the computer. She needs it when she's retired and reading a book. And he needs it when he's up late at night when his parents think he's asleep playing video games. Everybody needs a Zenny blocks. They put $1.7 million behind this one ad. So, are they crazy? I don't know. Maybe they sold a ton of ad, a ton of glasses. I didn't put comments in here because it wasn't space, but the comments, every fifth comment is someone taking a picture of themselves with their glasses on and posting it back to Zenny to see. So people love them. They're actually inexpensive. They're very stylish. Here's the next one. Seven hundred seventy thousand dollars. It got seventy-six thousand or million impressions, liked thirty-nine hundred times, shared two hundred forty-five times, and it's just an ad. It's just people wearing their glasses in different situations, being able to show everybody can wear a Zenny pair of glasses. Feels authentic. They're not necessarily telling a story. They're using advertising, but they're doing it in a way that is inclusive of everybody. And if it's inclusive of everybody, then you're going to get us. Hopefully, you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck. All right. Uh, just a little sneak peek. I'm not going to go through all top ten. Just so figure if you're getting bored, I'm not going to do it. But we're going to start. We're going to go here to number six. This is uh, my favorite one, DoorDash, because they're now they're putting in a lot of money. A lot of money. $31 million in Facebook, 37 altogether. They're targeting everybody. They're 50 50 men, women. Everybody needs food in the middle of the night. DoorDash is there to give it to you. They are all in on link posts. 90% of all of their ads are link posts. Let's take a look at what their link posts say. Tell me if, I mean, these guys are part of the disruption movement. They have an opportunity to be like, try this great cuisine, try amazing food, try it in your house. The whole city is open to you. No, they partner with Wendy's, with Chick-fil-A, with Chipotle, with these fast food brands. The number one ad on Facebook, DoorDash, a free Baconator with this code from Wendy's. They spent $570,000. Whoa. They spent $570,000, they got 57 million impressions and all these likes, all these comments. Did they win with all that money and this Baconator ad? Here's the thing, we call them likes, but they're really like emotions, right? They have six different options. These are not thumbs up likes. Let's take a look at what their comments look like. DoorDash is by far the worst delivery service I've ever used. And then DoorDash replied. Oh sweet, DoorDash delivers stomach aches and diarrhea. <laughs> Put the free code in, ordered a lot of money. They never, they still forgot my free Baconator. Shaking my head, DoorDash replies. Code would not work, shrug, DoorDash replies. Had an order, code didn't work. DoorDash is bullshit, I'm going back to Grubhub. DoorDash replies. 
Let me tell you about DoorDash's 2,500 comments, and that's on one ad. Every the pages and pages of people hating on DoorDash, and every one they reply, every single one. It's as if DoorDash, I don't know, I don't even want to say what they're doing. I'm not going to make a judgment. Maybe it's working for them. But in the top 10 ads that they ran, look at this one Wendy's, Chick fil A, Chipotle, Wendy's, Wild Buffalo Wild Wings, Cheesecake Factory. I like to think that if I'm sitting at home and I'm hungry, these are not my go-tos. That's just me, we're all different, we're all individual. But in terms of looking at some of those other brands which try to be inclusive of everybody, DoorDash is looking at one kind of person. The kind of person who likes that fast food in the middle of the night. <laughs> another one, another one. And let me tell you what the comments look like. Row after row after row. Here's my favorite. I have two drivers eat my fries. <laughs> DoorDash replied. They put a picture there. Look at this. Comments, comments, comments. They suck. They're so angry. These people are mad. I used DoorDash for the first time. My order was nine minutes late, but cold. Taco Bell should be five minutes. Where's my food? Totally useless. Waited 40 minutes. And when this is one mile away, look at this one up here. Why do you hate me? <laughs> These people are amazing. It's like one of those things I want to just go to DoorDash and read comments all day long. <laughs> Especially when you see like they're replying to every single one. And then other people are replying and everybody's, wait, 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 even back to this one, 30 people saw this, 184 people saw this. Like this can't be good. But maybe it's amazing. Maybe it just drives up a whole lot of sales. I mean, clearly people are trying them once, at least, and using them. I don't know. I don't know what their strategy is. Um, authentic? All right. Let's talk about numbers two through five. Uh, they were a little bit of a snooze fest. I was looking at them, trying to come up with, like, what's the story you tell? for Stitch Fix and Peloton and Hulu and Netflix. The story is these guys are spending a lot of money to put out advertising in front of their consumers. The ads are link posts, they try now, click now, sign up now, get a deal, sign up. The comments are all over the place if you look at them. Some people like them, some people don't like them. I don't know how to start drawing a, um, I don't know how to start drawing a lesson from what happens when a disruptive company becomes you know, established, no longer disruptive, no longer genius. Um, clearly these guys are very, very, very valuable brands. They're following very similar strategies. They're making a lot of money and they're spending a lot of money. Um, so if you want to look at what they're doing, we have all the data, we can talk about it after. Um, but I'm not going to go through slide after slide of it right now. Which brings me to number one, Uber. $92 million in digital spend last year, or this year I should say, with 84 of that going to Facebook. Now, <clears throat> put out 6,000 ads, 7,000 ads. Focus, we're going to talk about this in a second, very heavily in LA and New York. What are they doing? These are direct to consumer. They want you to pick up your phone, go to a cab, or a Uber. Look at the number one ad. They spent $1.3 million. It's a drive with Uber. Look at number two. $1.1 million. Uber eats, but they're not telling you to pick up the phone and call your get, you know, get your food. They're saying, hey, do you own a restaurant? Deliver with ease. Number three, drive with Uber. Number four, drive with Uber. $792,000. Number five, drive with Uber. Number eight, drive with oh, Uber Freight. That's basically drive with Uber if you have a big truck. It's the same thing. Uh, and number nine, drive with Uber. These guys are really investing their social strategy right now in finding uh, drivers. The consumer, I guess, is covered. Uh, maybe they're using only organic posts to, to, to reach them. Maybe they feel like there's so much press out there, they really need to, and, and, you know, it's a lot of negative press with regard to how they work with their drivers, maybe they really need to try to hook up their drivers. So if they're pushing to drivers all the time, 
let's click on an ad and find out what they're saying. Um, well, before I even get there, the other sort of breadcrumb that stuck out, when we look at the metro spend, when we look at how are they delivering their dollars across um, the country, we see maps like this all the time. Brands tend to focus on metropolitan areas with lighter shades of green in the middle and a few more dots, but never do we see numbers like this. 19% in Los Angeles, 11% in New York. At first you're like, oh, is this a glitch? Like, why? Why did we, why are they investing so much in Los Angeles? Are there like no drivers in Los Angeles? Well, so if you click in, it turns out they've got a new program. They're selling now to their drivers. They're saying, look, come drive with us, but don't use your car. Don't put all that mileage on your car. Rent one of our cars. A couple hundred dollars a week, that's fine. You can rent our car, you can drive our car all over the place, you can return it when you're done. It's like a zip car, but for Uber drivers. And it's launched in Los Angeles uh, and in New York. Although they just pulled it from New York, I guess some regulations changed and they're not allowed to do it. So we have an experience here now with a very established ultra, I'm not gonna say who it, ultra disruptor, right? They, they literally changed the world for every one. And now they're in a situation where they're hunting out new, new revenue streams. They're using social to find it. And they're using social, in essence, their drivers are part of now their consumer set. <clears throat> Interesting, maybe? Applicable to your life? I don't know. But it is the number one brand. They're spending almost a hundred million dollars to do it. So it certainly bears you know talking about it. So we come to the end. We've talked a lot about authenticity. We've talked a lot about data and how we can use data to understand if these brands are driving authentic stories and authentic relationships with their consumers. I leave it up to you on to how to take these lessons back and use them in your own jobs. Um, I have one solid recommendation, which is get pragmatics. I can do it up there. Um, but I'm going to skip all these. So they're, they're not here to one. Uh, I'm Ian. I'm going to take any questions. Yeah, I mean, they want to sell, right? So the strategy, we can not we can only infer yeah. what the strategy is, and I put it together in a way that tells my story. Yeah. Right? I don't want to do that.